we have a nice size audience with us today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Janet Messini, and on behalf of the Stony Brook Alumni Association, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us at our extremely popular election forum event. As you know, this week is Stay Homecoming, and we're also celebrating Giving Day. It's Stony Brook's opportunity to continue our beloved homecoming tradition and our vital Giving Day, where you can show support of favorite SBU departments like political science. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating in Stay Homecoming joining us here virtually. We can't wait till the day when we are back together again. And now I'm delighted to share a quick message from our university president. Hi, I'm Mari McInnes, president of Stony Brook University and newly inducted Seawolf. Homecoming is always a vibrant occasion on campus, and I wish that we could be together in person for the usual traditions. But homecoming continues to be a vibrant occasion for the Seawolf community, even in this different form. And even though we can't be together, I'm thrilled to see so many alumni, students, and friends showing their Seawolf spirit by celebrating Stay Homecoming Week. Thanks for joining me for our drive-in movie, election predictions, bingo, and so much more. I hope you enjoy this year's Stay Homecoming, and I can't wait to see you back on campus again. Go Seawolves. All right, and without any further delays, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Professor Leona. Leonie Huddy. Uh, she's the chair of the Department of Political Science in the College of Arts and Sciences. Welcome and thank you. Leonie, you're muted. I wanted to thank everyone for showing up today. I wanted to thank Janet and the Alumni Association for helping to arrange this. Um, in political science, we always would like to share with you what we're doing. Um, and this is a great opportunity at a very important time to give you a bit more information about what we've been up to. Um, so, I'm, uh, you know, this has been a, a very exciting, perhaps an overly exciting election season. Um, and so what we want to do today is try and get you back from the edge of your chair and give you some information that might help with analysis. Sometimes analysis is a good way to tamp down our emotional reactions to politics and look at it from a longer perspective. Um, and so we have three presenters who are going to tackle the election from different vantage points. Um, we're going to, each, each presenter is going to speak for about 15 minutes. Um, please feel free to put questions into the chat box. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on that, but we will hold questions until after the presentations. Um, but please, as things come up, start posting questions and I'll be working through those. We may not get to all of them. Um, I'm sure you have a lot to ask us about and uh, we may have a lot to say about your questions. Um, so let me go through each of our presenters and uh, give you a, a little bit of background for each one. Uh, our first presenter is going to be Professor Helmut Norpath. Some of you may have taken classes for him. And so you know that he's an expert in polling and elections and very famous and quite renowned for his forecasting model, which famously and, and rarely predicted President Trump's victory in 2016. Um, and so he is going to share with us his forecast for this election. Um, so um, stay tuned for that. You'll be hearing more about that, but you'll also hear about what goes in to his model. Um, Professor Feldman is an expert on polling, public opinion from a political psychology standpoint. Um, he is currently working on uh, the last several decades and trends within American public opinion that have resulted in changes within the party system. Um, I think he's hoping that by next year, his book on authoritarianism and party sorting will be out. Uh, let's hope so. Um, and so he's going to share with us, I think, an overview of what may be different about this election. It's certainly an unusual election 
and we'll be sharing a lot of public opinion information about that. Um, our third presenter is Professor Yana Kripnikov. Um, she's also an expert on public opinion. Um, her particular specialty is looking at political participation and she'll be sharing information with us um, about non-voters, levels of engagement. Um, she's also working on a book currently to do with um, high levels of political engagement and who those people are. And uh, its title is The Other Divide, Polarization and um, Disengagement in American Politics. So she'll be sharing with us some information on turnout, what we should be looking for um, in the election to examine levels of engagement, how that might influence the outcome. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Norpath, who has about 15 minutes and I'm going to be a bit like stern on the timekeeping. So just watch me because um, we'll be like er, at some point. Um, so Professor Norpath, if you want to share your slides with us, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Leone. Let me just uh, see whether I can get it to work, okay. Um, all right, uh, can everybody see this? Uh, um, all right, let me just begin by... Uh, hmm. uh, I don't know. Okay. All right. Remember 2016, which was a very difficult year for uh, predicting the outcome of, of the election. And uh, uh, I'm not quite sure whether a lot of people who, who made predictions uh, and are making it again have uh, remembered enough about uh, what went on uh, last time. Let me go quickly because uh, I've only uh, uh, 15 minutes. So here's one just quickly. Somebody who made a lot of money, um, $1.5 million. Well, it wasn't me. Uh, it was a man that you see right here, a Brit, billionaire. He can have uh, money, to, money, money to burn, I guess. And, uh, but he also had put, put down a lot of money to do that. So he uh, had 350,000 uh, pounds to put into this bid. I guess the odds were something like, like uh, three to one. Um, it used to be uh, possible in this country to do this kind of betting, big money on Wall Street. Uh, this is from 1932. Um, the betting odds on Roosevelt were, were, were pretty good for him and not so good for, for, for the other guy. Uh, this kind of betting no longer is allowed in this country, but you can do smaller ones. And if you're interested, I can refer you to some legal betting sites. Let me uh, take you to... Um, uh, what I'm using to make a prediction. Uh, the first thing is really something that uh, probably many of you have noticed if you just take a quick look at presidential elections. And here's a snapshot from the last uh, uh, 60 years. I'm gonna go quickly. Here you have a pattern where a White House party has been in office for one term, which of course is what the situation is right now. The Republicans under Trump have held the White House for one term. And, in that situation since 1960, uh, you have, uh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven wins out of eight contests. Uh, that uh, is pretty good in terms of uh, setting odds. On the other hand, all right, when uh, you have a situation that we had in 2016, the White House Party has been in office for two terms or more. Uh, uh, they usually win, almost always win one law. So you have a very sharp dichotomy in American elections, uh, depending on uh, how long a party has held the White House. And that's a very uh, useful tool to forecast. It um, really has no theory behind it. It's just a, an observation that over a long time you can make, and uh, which is not something likely to happen by chance alone. Uh, here's a little bit longer. A picture of elections. Uh, oops, no, these are sunspot data. Um, the election data look like this. I'm just playing with you a little bit to give you a little feeling that maybe electoral analysis is certainly closer to astronomy than to astrology. Uh, when you look at elections sort of in the aggregate, uh, things are actually pretty, pretty well behaved. And what you see right here is uh, a back and forth cycles that, uh, that last 
usually uh, about five terms, meaning a party holds a White House for two and a half terms, which is a little bit like what I what I showed you before. So this is a very uh, uh, very helpful tool. And now, in this case, it goes back uh, 200 years, and over 200 years, things like that don't just happen by chance. So even though uh, I can't give you a theory about this, why this is happening, uh, some people have tried to look at that. I don't think we have a a convincing answer for that. Uh, so this is one part. It's not part of the name of my model. Names have to be short and compact. My uh, the name primary model uh, keys in on the fact that uh, the United States has primary elections and uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, ability to make predictions from that is something that, uh, well, I, uh, I don't know, I maybe stumbled upon. It's not really something that you would read in many uh, textbooks of American politics or even studies of voting, et cetera. Uh, primaries are, well, they're sort of one thing, ele general elections are, are something else. Um, but uh, going back more than more than 100 years to the election of 1912, and I think you all recognize uh, these people in there, uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson and William Howard Taft, uh, one a Democrat, one uh, a Republican. And the man on the right, uh, the roly-poly guy, William Howard Taft, faced an unusual challenge in the election of 1912 that produced a pattern that I am taking advantage of for my forecast in addition to the sort of back and forth of presidential election outcomes. So here are uh, primaries, which I actually started in 1912. 1912 is the year in which presidential primaries uh, became part of the uh, electoral process. Uh, it's something I would say uh, most people, uh, even people in my field, probably aren't, aren't too aware of. Uh, and so what you have is uh, in the Republican primaries, uh, you have uh, three people, Taft, the sitting president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, a former president, very formidable foe, and somebody called Bob LaFollette from Wisconsin, a progressive. Uh, and so what you can see already in the picture, the light uh, green or brownish color is Teddy Roosevelt's victories. He won most of the states. They had primaries about around dozen. Um, uh, Bob LaFollette won a couple. And... Uh, William Howe Taft, the uh, sitting president, embarrassingly so, only one, two, not even a some state. Um, altogether, um, this is the outcome for the Republican side. Uh, Taft, uh, the sitting president, is a loser in presidential in his primaries in his party. Uh, very unusual. I, th I think he's he is one of only two who had that happen to them. So that's a pretty pretty rare. Uh, misfortune or, or, or thing to, 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 to have happened to you. On the Democratic side, you have a man called Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, the one in the picture, uh, winning the primary, so quite, quite narrowly, but that's the out party, so usually things are pretty competitive there. And uh, so fast forward to the election outcome in November. Uh, well, first we have to make a note that uh, uh, William Howe Taft, even though he lost the primaries, won the nomination at the Republican convention. Uh, the party stuck with him, uh, turned its back on uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So the Republican party goes into the election with a primary loser against a party, the Democratic party that nominates a primary winner. And guess what? The primary winner ends up victorious in November. Uh, I would gather uh, <laughs> that uh, the prediction that uh, uh, nobody ever noticed that or commented on that or made a big deal about it. Papers at the time didn't, and I don't think any book on presidential elections, uh, at least I couldn't, couldn't find anything. Now to, to go your, give you a quick uh, uh, snapshot of, of uh, 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 future elections after 1912, uh, was not an, not an exception, it was not an anecdote, it was not something that that didn't happen again. You almost find it in every election after that. Uh, a primary winner goes on to win the general election in November. And if two people won the primary, like 1980, Carter, the sitting, a sitting president, Reagan as a challenger, the one who's doing better 
in primaries goes on to win. That's pretty much a rule. There are almost, almost no exceptions to that. Uh, so that's, that's a, a very powerful predictor, much more, much more powerful than just sort of watching whether you're in the first or, or second term. Now, um, Amadeus time, uh, getting close? Leone? Okay. Um, now, five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> all right. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we all know, uh, even from casual observation, is that not all primaries are equal. And New Hampshire is clearly uh, a one of a kind primary. It is the first primary, it's been that way for, I don't know, 70 years or more. Um, it also is very easy to get on the ballot for candidates. Uh, this is something probably most people don't know either. Gives you some ideas. So you want to be a presidential candidate. Thousand dollar is all it takes. So a lot of candidates go in there. There's there's no hurdle for candidates to get in there. So it's a real uh, a strong test of the ability. Independents can vote, which means it's not a party based election. All right. Yes, Republicans and Republican. Okay. So let me go down. Um, but not always. And in particular, I, I sort of learned that the hard way in uh, 2008 when uh, I, uh, I uh, stuck with New Hampshire as the number one, and of course Barack Obama lost the New Hampshire primary. That's usually not a good sign for going on uh, to win the election, but uh, he went on to do that. Uh, the same was true for Bill Clinton already earlier, which I sort of not uh, paid attention to. And uh, so what I did uh, to compensate for, for that uh, is to include one, more primary, uh, early one follows right on the heels of New Hampshire, uh, not South Carolina, and what it what it offers for a prediction, especially for the Democratic side, more than the Republican side, is a large group that's missing in New Hampshire. Uh, New Hampshire, I mean, pretty much a white state. Black voters, almost half the Democratic primary voters, um, uh, gets intense media coverage, uh, very low threshold for candidate entry, et cetera. And uh, so what I, what I did 2016 for the first time is to combine the results of New Hampshire and South Carolina to get a, a measure of primary performance for uh, the candidates. Okay, so let me go quickly how this worked out in 2020. Uh, and as you can see on the Democrat and the Democratic primary, you don't even see Joe Biden among the top three. Uh, he was in fifth place. Uh, in single digits, very bad, very poor. Uh, I think most people gave him up for dead after that anyway. And, uh, but he had his great comeback. I think he planned on that. It was not a, not a fluke or something that just happened overnight. I think it was a firewall and many other sort of states like that uh, favored him very strongly in Democratic uh, primary. So I combined for, for, for Biden, uh, these two for Trump was difficult because uh, the uh, Republican Party and, uh, canceled the South Carolina primary. I guess there was no competition, but there was some in New Hampshire. Uh, William Well, you may have forgotten about him, a pre pretty prominent Republican, ran against uh, Donald Trump, uh, but only got 9% against Donald Trump's 86%. So Donald Trump clearly uh, took New Hampshire with a commanding vote. Look at that contrast. I think you all recognize this guy, Pat Buchanan in 92, uh, didn't win, didn't beat uh, George H. W. Bush, but pushed him down to something like, like 53%. That was not good enough for a sitting president to do. And if Donald Trump had fared like this, my forecast in the end would have been very different. But the way it works out, if I combine the kind of uh, swing of the pendulum back and forth in presidential elections with the outcome of primaries in New Hampshire and South Carolina for the Democrat and, and just New Hampshire for Donald Trump. My prediction is, and what I did this time too for the first time, I never did this before, is to make an electoral college prediction, straight electoral college, I ignore the popular vote. We know when there's a discrepancy, popular vote uh, doesn't really matter. And uh, so my prediction uh, for these two guys based on uh, the combination of factors that I use is Donald Trump has a 91% chance of winning re-election, Biden a 9% uh, 
And in terms of electoral votes, my numerical prediction is Donald Trump 362 votes and Joe Biden 176, the remainder. Um, that's a prediction I made quite a while ago. People keep asking me. I got just about <laughs> 10 requests every day. Are you still sticking to it? Do you consider COVID? Do you consider George Floyd? Do you consider, uh, I don't know, the visit to the Walter Reed and all that? My answer is no. That forecast was written in stone almost literally. There's no way I can, up, I, I can update it. I can update it. I have no leverage. I have no variable like October surprise, stick it in there, get something else. So sink, sink or swim, that's it. Thank you so much, Helmut. So I've already had several questions. We're not going to deal with the questions yet, but people are asking you the kind of questions that you've been asked throughout, which is, aren't you going to update this? Mm -hmm. So our next presenter, uh, Professor Feldman, will uh, walk us through some of the recent poll results and talk a little bit about what might be different this year. And we'll come back and have a heated discussion about this at the end. We can uh, ha have a thorough discussion and you can pose your questions to Professor Norpoth then about his model. So thank you. Give me one second to get my slides up. Okay. Um, so, um, Helmut gave you um, a very nice discussion of the, this election in the context of the history of presidential elections in the US, at least since, uh, uh, at least since 1960. Um, and um, what he, he showed us um, was what might be expected if this was a more or less typical um, election year. So what I want to do is provide um, some understanding of why I think this is an unusual election year and how that might um, influence um, what we're seeing and what the outcome might be and any deviations from past history. So um, first of all, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detour for just a minute because I want to make an po important point about understanding the outcome of American presidential elections and something that you need to be really, really concerned about, um, especially if you're you know, one of these people who um, uh, checks your computer every morning to see what the, near, what the most latest polls were. Um, and that is um, the, um, the fact, as Helmut pointed out, that uh, presidential elections in the U.S. are decided on the base of electoral college vote, not the popular vote. And uh, that has some really major implications. And so what you see up on the screen right now is um, some results from six states' um, actual votes in 2016 and uh, votes for Trump, vote for Clinton, and notice the difference, right? And so what I want you to appreciate, and I think what is sometimes hard to appreciate, is how close some of these state results can be. Um, and in particular, um, I listed Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin first, um, because if the results of those three states had gone the other way, if Clinton had won Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, she would have um, had the majority in the Electoral College. And if you look over, you just see it, it's really striking how small the differences were um, in the vote totals in those three states. Across, summed across Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, the sum total of the difference between Trump and Clinton was a little under 78,000 votes out of about 9 million cast. Right? So think about that for a second. 78,000 votes out of uh, about 9 million. There, we can think of any number of reasons that could have affected the outcome of 10,000, the decision of 10,000 voters in Michigan or 22,000 voters in Wisconsin. Um, and by that small a margin, right, um, Trump beat Clinton in those states and that was the difference in the election. To see what effect that can have, um, let me just show you the results in 2016 and then 2012. 
So um, as we know, Clinton won a majority of the popular vote in 2016. Um, she actually polled about 3 million more votes nationally than Trump did and about 2% more of the vote. Despite that, Trump won 304 electro electoral college votes compared to Clinton's 227. Jump back to 2012. Um, uh, the different, the vote total between Romney and Obama was slightly larger, 5 million nationally compared to, to uh, 3 million. Romney actually got a larger fraction of the vote in 2012, 47% compared to Trump's 46%. But given the way the votes fell that year, Romney's 47% netted him only 206 electoral college votes, where Trump's 46% got him 304 electoral college votes in the win. So, you know, as, as you're listening to analysts, be cautious about who's going to win um, and how confident they are. Um, I want you to appreciate the extent to which the electoral college can magnify very small differences in votes and turn them into um, uh, majorities um, under, under um, you know, very tenuous conditions. Okay, so um, like Helmut, I'm gonna start off with a historical perspective, um, slightly different one, um, probably a simpler one. I don't have a model, but I'm gonna show you some data. What I'm gonna show you is presidential popularity in re, uh, among incumbents in re-election years, right? So all I did was I go, went to um, available presidential popularity data um, for every um, incumbent running for re-election since Eisenhower in 1956 and looked for um, a measure of presidential popularity in the last poll I could find before election day usually in, in October, but sometimes a little bit earlier. And so here's what you see um, in terms of uh, all the, the incumbent presidents who are running for reelection. What you see is um, their popularity in, in fall before the election and whether they won or lost the election. Right? Um, there are a few interesting things to be gleaned from this. Um, one is probably not surprising. Um, that incumbents who are more popular are much more likely to win, and, and when they're very popular, they win by large margins. Um, also note, if you scan down um, um, the slide, that you'll see that the tipping point for re-election is somewhere around 50%. Obama had a uh, popularity of around 52% when he won re-election in 2012. George W. Bush, 48%, but there were other polls um, in the fall in October of that year where his popularity was about 50%. So it looks like somewhere in the vicinity of 50% is a tipping point, and that incumbent presidents who run for re-election with popularity of about 50% or higher invariably get re-elected, and notice that the incumbents um, Gerald Ford is obviously a strange case since he was not actually elected uh, president but took over from Richard Nixon. But uh, whether you count Ford or not, the presidents who incumbents who ran for re-election and lost were incumbents who had popularity well below popularity ratings well below 50 percent. Also note that it's fairly unusual, right? At least since 1956 for incumbent um, presidents to, um, to run for re-election um, with popularity, uh, 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 with popularity um, levels below 50%. So what about this year? Um, at the moment, Donald Trump's popularity is roughly about 43%, um, better than George H.W. Bush and Jimmy Carter. Um, but certainly below the 50% threshold that seems to be um, the, the deciding um, point between um, winning and losing based upon all these um, campaigns, uh, elections since 1956. So um, one thing that's unusual is that 
that at the moment, Donald Trump is one of the few candidates in recent history, incumbent candidates, to be running for re-election with a popularity of under 50%. But that's not all, right? He's unusual in another respect. And to see that, let me just show you some patterns of presidential popularity from um, other recent presidents. So what you see here is um, a chart uh, a graph showing uh, Bill Clinton's presidential approval ratings from the time he was elected in 1992 until he left office at the end of 2000. At the end of 2000, and what you'll notice is there's quite a bit of variation. Right, um, there are times at which Bill Clinton is extremely popular, over 70 percent. There are times when his popularity drops well below 50 percent, down into 40 percent range. And so you can see that Bill Clinton was at various times fairly popular, various times unpopular. Sometimes they're really extreme cases, right? There's George W. Bush, which is probably the most extreme variability in presidential popularity you can see. That big spike over on the left is his popularity right after 9-11. Notice that in 2004, it certainly had dropped, but stayed right about at that 50% level. And by the time uh, George W. Bush left office um, in 2008, he was extremely unpopular. Um, one other example, Ronald Reagan. We think of Reagan as someone who um, was a very popular president, but notice that while he was at times a very popular president, um, there was also at least one occasion when his popularity dropped below 40%. So um, the pattern that we see for most presidents is actually over their term a great deal of variability. Um, in contrast, um, Barack Obama's popularity looks relatively flat compared to what I just showed you. But even if you look at this pretty closely, you'll notice that there were times when Obama's popularity approached and exceeded 60% in other periods when his popularity dropped down to 40%. Not as much as some of the others, but still quite a bit of variability. Right? So that's the pattern. All right? Now here is Donald Trump's popularity ratings over his four, almost four years so far. And what's, act, what's really remarkable is they barely move right? There's, what you see is almost no significant movement in um, ratings of Donald Trump um, over the, the period since he was elected um, from the beginning of, of um, uh, 2017. Um, a bit, a, a brief moment or two earlier this year when his popularity almost ticked up to 50%, uh, but that didn't last very long. And you, what you see is his popularity basically um, right around up and down 40%. Okay. So what's so on you, why this unusual pattern? Why do we see so little movement in, in his, his popularity ratings? And the answer, at least to a great extent, is the growth of partisan polarization. Okay. Um, this is a very colorful graph. Uh, what it shows is going back to Eisenhower, um, approval ratings of each president um, from members of their own party and members of the out party. So the red line is ratings for Republicans, the blue line for each president rating for Democrats. Um, what's not, what probably shouldn't be surprising is if, if you're a Republican and there's a Republican president, you like him more than, than if you're a Democrat. And that's always been the case. But if you look across the screen, you'll notice that the gap between ratings of Democrats and Republicans jumped for Reagan, right? It jumped again for George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And if you look at Obama, you would think polarization can't get much more extreme than this, right? Um, but in fact, it has. So if you look at the far right, you'll see something actually quite remarkable um, on average, Republican approval ratings for Donald Trump have been pretty consistently uh, in the high 80s. Um, approval ratings for Donald Trump among Democrats have been in the single digits almost all the way through, uh, almost as polarized as ratings can possibly be. Just to give you a, a closer glimpse at this, this is a, his popularity broken down by Republicans, independents, and Democrats. And again, just no movement, right? Uh, Republicans from the very beginning have stood behind Bush. 
Democrats from the very beginning have opposed Bush and nothing that's happened. Um, the, the growth in the economy in the early part of, of the Trump administration, impeachment, the coronavirus, um, you hardly see anything moving that, right? Can anything at this point move um, um, attitudes? So what about the first debate, all right? So those of you who saw the first debate might think surely this would have a big effect, right? And so what I'll show you is the results of before and after from an online panel of people who watched the debate. And there is a slightest indication that uh, disapproval, unfavorable ratings of Trump went up from before to after the debate and favorable ratings of Joe Biden went up from before to after the debate. But look at how small the movement was, right? Barely noticeable, right? So everybody who watched that debate, the impact on judgments of Biden and Trump were virtually negligible. Okay. So finally, let me finish and come back to the looming issue, the coronavirus, um, one that was going to be a factor in the election no matter what, and now obviously we can't escape since Donald Trump has tested positive and been hospitalized for the coronavirus. So let me just show you two things, right? How do Americans think this is going? And this is from polls that were conducted just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and you can see in response to the first question that a, a clear majority of Americans are quite worried about the virus, right? 31% very worried, 34% um, more somewhat worried. Um, and, a, and most people do not think the country has the virus under control. So there's a lot of concern remaining um, among the Amer members of the American public about whether or not they or their family might catch the virus and whether or not um, it's been under control. How does this spill over into ratings of Donald Trump? The first two questions were ones that I got just before his um, diagnosis, a positive test for the coronavirus. So this was before he was hospitalized. And you can see that large majority of Americans at that point thought that the U.S. response had not been successful and by about a 60-40 margin um, uh, disapproved of the way Trump was handling the coronavirus. The last question was one that I just found yesterday that was asked after his diagnosis. Do you think that Donald Trump acted responsibly or irresponsibly in handling the risk of infection? People who might have been around him most recently, 63% irresponsibly, 33% responsibly. Um, not a very good um, um, uh, rating from the American public in terms of um, this issue, which is bound to be front and center for the rest of this campaign. And so finally, um, consistent with what I just showed you about partisan polarization, um, this is a graph um, showing um, horse race polls um, dating from early July until today. The top blue line is um, um, people preferring um, Joe Biden, the bottom red line, people preferring Donald Trump. And again, what's amazing, and I don't have time to show you this, but typically in, in presidential campaigns, um, the, the gap between the candidates changes, um, um, sometimes multiple times during the, during the campaign. What you see is incredible stability um, a margin in these in national polls um, for Biden over Trump that's barely varied from about six and a half to, to eight percent. And yes, if you look at the right hand side, it does appear that the margin is increasing um, since the first debate. And I'll anticipate questions by just finishing and saying, I think it's a little too soon to know whether or not that's going to uh, remain. Or, um, or as things like this have happened in the past, um, this will in fact revert back um, to where we were a few weeks ago. Uh, but again, notice ex how stable um, the horse race polls have been um, for, for the last three months. And I will finish right there. Thank you.
um, Stanley Kristolman. That was it. so. Now we've got two contrasting views of what might happen in this election. So lots of uh, fuel discussion after we've finished. We're going to turn to Professor Yana Krupnikov next to, to change topics slightly and talk about turnout and engagement during the election. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm, as Leonie just said, going to turn toward voters uh, because um, someone's going to have to vote for these people and actually turn out uh, for somebody to actually win. So we often think of elections as actually hinging entirely on turnout, and this isn't any different. This election will likely hinge on who is going to turn out to vote. Uh, so what can we say about these people? What can we say about who's going to vote, who might not vote? Why won't they vote? Can we convince these people who aren't going to vote to vote? Well, I'm going to kind of look at three questions here. I'm going to look at what kinds of people are most likely to turn out. Um, and then I'm going to basically talk about whether we can convince people to turn out. And in particular, can we convince people to turn out in the context of 2020, right? Can we convince people to mail in ballots to vote during a pandemic? This question of who's most likely to vote is something that political scientists have been looking at for quite a while, but it's something that is often kind of difficult to study. First of all, a lot of non-voters don't want to tell you that they're not voters. They will pretend that they actually vote quite frequently. Um, another issue that often happens is that they might not necessarily want to take surveys. So uh, fortunately, uh, just a bit uh, a, a while ago, um, on this past year, I had a chance to be part of a survey with the Knight Foundation that specifically looked at a very large sample of people who don't vote. Um, we looked at people who uh, haven't voted in many, many elections, which kind of gives a glimpse as to who these people are and why they don't vote. And what emerges is that there are really these three groups of people. One group is what I'm going to term persistent non-voters. So it's people who, who just don't vote. Um, they haven't voted in the last four or five, however many elections. The other group I'm going to call active voters. These are people you can count on to turn out most of the time. And the final group that, uh, just to foreshadow where I'm going, are these occasional voters. Sometimes they vote, sometimes they don't. Uh, maybe if it's cold that day, they're not going to vote. Maybe it's, if it's a great weather day, they're going to turn out to vote. Maybe if they're really excited, they're going to turn out to vote. And so the crux as to when these elections hinge on turnout are really these occasional voters. So what divides these groups of people and what can we expect them to do in 2020? Um, people who are active voters um, and political science research has suggested this for decades, they are more educated, they are wealthier, they are deeply connected within their communities. Um, so what that means is that they have networks and families um, who might encourage them to vote. Uh, they might have friends that might encourage them and invite them to vote. Another thing that emerges from the survey with Knight Foundation is that these people are also much more likely to follow the news, which is something we should have expected, really. Um, so when asked how closely do you follow the news, 40% of active voters say they follow the news very closely. Um, uh, only 24% of non-voters say they follow the news very closely. So when, as I imagine, many people who chose to attend this particular webinar ask themselves, how could somebody not vote given what's happening in the news, it's probably because they're not really watching the news all that closely. Another kind of interesting thing about these groups of people, of voters and non-voters, is that active voters are actively searching out the news. Um, they might, just hypothetically speaking, wake up in the morning and reach for their phones to check what thing has happened. Um, non-voters, 56% uh, say they actively look out for news, but a large group of them are basically saying that they are essentially just bumping into news. So they might kind of be going about their day-to-day -day lives, they might go on social media, and then they might see the news happen. So what about um, kind of these groups differentiates them? Are they politically different? Uh, well, they actually aren't all that politically different. As we see kind of in, in their partisanship, the patterns of party within voters and non-voters actually look quite similar. 
what emerges is kind of the largest difference between voters and non-voters, these kind of chronic non-voters, people who never vote, is how uncertain they are about politics in general. Um, in the survey of non-voters versus voters, what we see is that non-voters aren't sure what their party is. They're not sure where they stand on issues. When asked about 2020, they actually said they weren't really sure how they felt about Donald Trump. And so that might be hard to imagine that somebody is uncertain how they feel about Donald Trump, but uh, a lot of people who aren't as engaged in politics just express this fairly tremendous uncertainty. So why don't these people vote? Um, in the story of non-voters, people were given the opportunity to basically express in their own words why it is that they did not vote. Um, and then the survey company coded the responses to these questions. So these weren't options that were given to people. This is people volunteering how they felt about voting and how they felt about politics. And the kind of modal response, the answer that emerged from these known voters is that they didn't vote because they just don't care. They're not interested. They are not really engaged with politics. Now, I want to say that there are certainly other um, answers that emerge. There are people who say that the system is too complicated for them to vote. Uh, there are people who say that the system is too corrupt for them to vote. I should note that um, actually in other measures, it's people who are very active voters who are more likely to say that special interests control the, uh, the, our political system. But in general, what emerges from these kind of chronic non-voters, people who haven't voted in the last four or five elections, is that they are just not interested in politics. So when we think about who's going to turn out to vote, can we convince people to vote, how can anyone possibly not vote in this coming election, we have to think about these different groups. Um, can we can, and can we convince anyone to vote in the 2020 election? So, um, when we think about these groups, uh, the, when we think about these persistent non-voters, the people who don't care, the people who say, I'm not voting because I'm not interested, they're probably not going to vote in 2020. When we think about the active voters, um, people who have voted in every election, um, they will probably vote. Um, they will probably vote even as um, the conditions for voting become more difficult. So the real question here, are these occasional voters? People who aren't entirely committed to voting in every election, uh, but people who have voted in the past. What does 2020 mean for them? Are they going to turn out? Can they be convinced to turn out? Can they be convinced not to turn out? Is something going to happen not to, uh, uh, to prevent them from actually turning out to vote? So what can we say about that? Well, if we look at research in political science, the one thing that really emerges is this challenge of voting. Voting is extremely effortful. It may not seem effortful, but if we think about it, it requires a lot out of people. And this effort is actually um, unequally distributed. If you are a person who is a single parent, um, if you were a person, for example, who uh, works an hourly wage um, in a pandemic, if you're a person who's under risk, if you're in a state, for example, they won't let you vote by mail, the effort is going to be uneven. So the way to kind of get around this idea of effort is, as research suggests, twofold. Um, we can make people just so motivated to vote that they will overcome any challenges. Um, I just read, for example, yesterday, this story of a woman who's, I think, 100 years old. She's voted in every election, and she voted while wearing like a ton of protective gear. Right? So somebody that motivated um, is going to vote. The other thing we can do for people is to make it less effortful. We can make it easier on them to turn out and cast their ballots. So can we do this in 2020? Could voting be perceived as especially important in the 2020 election? Right? Is, 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 can we make, convince people that um, overcoming these barriers and turning out is going to be something that's profoundly important to them? Um, but on the other hand, uh, has voting become 
to be perceived as especially difficult in the 2020 election, um, especially as kind of uh, geographically, there are certain states that are closing down drop-off boxes that are actually actively trying to make voting more difficult for people. So what does the research suggest to this point? The first thing I wanna to turn to is this idea of motivation. Can we increase the motivation of people to vote in the 2020 election? Do we need to convince these occasional voters that this is an especially important election for them to vote in? The first thing that we know about people's political attention is that there's a huge variance uh, in the attention that people pay to politics. We often think of this as this idea of, well, there, there's people who aren't paying any attention at all and some people paying some attention. But kind of to give you a different perspective, I would say that attention varies because there is a minority of people who are paying a ton of attention. They're following politics every day. They're refreshing their news feeds. Um, they're on social media tweeting about it. Um, they are carefully following every single thing that happens. And so for these groups of people, every piece of news is profoundly important. Every piece of news helps them motivate that much more to turn out and vote. But on the other hand, um, most Americans are paying some attention. Uh, just because somebody does not know every single detail of every single piece of news that has happened doesn't mean they don't necessarily realize um, the particular importance of a given political moment. Doesn't under, that doesn't mean that they don't necessarily realize that um, it's important to vote. Doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't heard about the big thing. Sometimes people who pay a lot of attention um, might kind of be horrified that there's somebody out there who doesn't know everything about the news, but that's not the same as saying that people know nothing or that they aren't paying any attention. And if we look at the most recent data, this is from Pew, 83% um, of people report that this election really matters. So they're pretty convinced that this is an important election. This is from um, uh, just this past Monday, uh, this weekend from YouGov. 78% um, of people report that they care a lot about who wins the election. So on some level, if it's a question of motivation, if it's really making people care that this is an important election, the majority of Americans are already there. They believe this is an important election. They, be, they care a lot about who wins and who holds the presidency for the next four years. So most people already know there's something important happening. Um, even if they can't tell you every single news detail, even if they can't tell you every, if, if not refreshing every, their news feed every single moment. So then the question we get to is, um, are the circumstances? Are the logistics going to make voting so effortful that this motivation, this perception of importance is not going to be enough? Um, so let's kind of put aside just for now this idea that there are certain states that are kind of effectively trying to make voting a bit more difficult. And let's think about how can we actually help people overcome uh, a sort of uncertain voting environment. One thing that has often emerged and has emerged recently is that people just don't have enough information about how to vote. So this idea that in order to make voting easier for people, we need to tell them more and more about the process of voting. And that's a really intuitive response, right? If people, to make things easier, just tell people how to do it. But this is only likely to vote, uh, to work to a point. Um, in some research that I did with um, Elizabeth Connors, who is an alum of Stony Brook University, um, we find that giving people too much information about voting could make voting a bit more difficult. So as we are in this very odd 2020 point, trying to convince people who already believe this is an important election to vote, um, it becomes kind of this really uh, gray area. We can give people more information about voting, 
but we have to be careful to make sure that people don't start to perceive voting as being much too difficult. And there's data to suggest that people are perceiving voting in 2020 as likely to be quite difficult. Um, there is something about voting in a pandemic with um, uncertain voting procedures that is leaving people feeling like this is going to be hard for them. So for example, 49% of people expect voting difficulties. This is from Pew. Th this number is very unevenly distributed. 35% uh, of Trump supporters expect difficulties, but 60% of Biden supporters expect that it'll be difficult for them to vote. So um, there is reason to believe that people do expect to have some difficulty casting their ballots. So what does this mean? Well, it means that consistent voters are going to turn out and they're going to vote. The next question becomes, what is going to happen to everyone else? There is a lot of rhetoric about the difficulty of voting. Um, and I think that the effect of this rhetoric is going to be really important. Um, some of this rhetoric is incredibly well-meaning, people sort of highlighting issues with voting. But I think that's an important question to sort of think about whether even well-meaning highlights of, of difficulties with voting are actually going to make people believe that it's profoundly difficult. Pictures of long lines might discourage people, and these difficulties are likely to be unevenly perceived. And the other issue is that political science research suggests that giving people the chance to vote early does not necessarily encourage voting. Um, People often vote because they think it's something that everyone does together. It is a very social activity. It is a special day. People vote on election day because they think it is special to do so. Um, once we change that image of election day, once people are voting by mail, a lot of people are voting early, is that also going to make voting seem really difficult? So I think 2020 is a point in time where voting is difficult to predict. A lot of people, I would say more so than in past elections want to vote. They deeply care about these outcomes. They deeply care about who wins. The question becomes, um, ha are we in this odd moment where people care a good deal, but also anticipate a lot of difficulties? And so I wanna end on kind of a more positive note, I guess, uh, which is um, how can you convince your friends to vote, right? Because um, essentially, I think a lot of people are trying to convince the people around them to turn out and to vote. One thing that research suggests really encourages voting is when it's characterized as a social approach, is something that can be done together, something that you do that's not all that difficult. Um, I was talking to a, a really great Stony Brook undergrad the other day, and she was saying she's gonna text all her friends in the same manner that she might text them like, hey, we're all gonna get dinner, but she's gonna text them and say, we're all gonna vote, right? We're, we're all gonna do this thing. Um, and she, she's not gonna ask them who they're gonna vote for. She's gonna say, it's a thing that we're gonna do. And that's great. People who are in networks of voters are much more likely to vote. But one thing that research suggests is entirely ineffective is shaming. So if you really want somebody to vote, um, encourage them, tell them it's something that uh, can be done, something that they can do. But, uh, and this has been shown in political science and in health research as well, telling people that they should be ashamed of themselves and shaming them into voting is not a really great approach to helping them vote. Um, and it's not something that is encouraged, encouraging them. So occasional voters can be persuaded to vote, but the key is to give them that social environment and to give them that network um, of other voters, which will help them turn out to vote and turn out to vote, especially at a time when it seems very, very difficult to do so, like 2020. Thank you. So thank you so much to all of our speakers. We're, I think, reasonably within time, and we have about a half an hour for Q&A. Um, I have some questions. I wanted to start, um, where, where pile, questions are piling up, but now I'll really put them in because um, some of you are touching on the same topic. So I'm going to try and pick out some, try and pick out different kinds of questions to pose. So I wanted to ask, and I, this question was directed at uh, Professor Norpath, but I'm going to bring in Professor Feldman as well. 
and it's from Christopher Ryan, who said, um, Professor Norpath has predicted another Trump victory. How does Trump getting COVID impact this prediction? Does this change um, top strategists say Trump getting COVID is the worst thing that could happen to him? Um, so uh, maybe you could start, uh, Helmut, uh, with your reaction. I know you've already told us, hey, the model is fixed. <laughs> Yeah, well, the simple answer is the model is written in stone, or the, the forecast is written in stone, literally speaking, when it comes out. There's no uh, handle to, to make any adjustments. So whatever happens, uh, I can. I mean, not, not that I wouldn't, couldn't imagine that uh, this would happen, uh, this would have an impact on the election. But uh, the forecast itself has no, like, October surprise uh, dummy or something like that in there. Uh, that I could that I that I that I that I could apply, and so uh, I'm stuck. <laughs> okay, so uh, Professor Feldman, do you want to say anything about COVID? You mentioned that um, you touched on it in your presentation. Yeah, I think um, you know. I think two points. One, um, I I do want to again emphasize just how polarized and stable a lot of Americans are that that you know that that uh, no matter what has happened um, there are people who believe in Donald Trump and don't aren't deterred and there are other people who have intensely negative reactions and nothing seems to move them as well so I think there are limits to the effect, you know, that, that these events will have. Having said that, to the extent to which there are some people who are still persuadable, how, however many of those people are still left, I don't think that this is helping, um, that this is helping Trump. Um, the, um, you know, I looked at a lot of poll data over the last few days, and it's all very consistent in people continuing to be worried about the virus, thinking that it's not under control, thinking that a lot of places are opening up too quickly, and the this 64, 60% 60 to 40% unfavorable rating for Trump. On, on the virus has been pretty consistent now for um, quite a number of weeks, if not months. So, um, and even if nothing else, the fact that he contracted the virus, went into the hospital, is now back in the White House, even if that event by itself doesn't have any effect, what it does is it keeps the virus front and center in the news. and based upon everything I've seen, that can't be helpful to, to Donald Trump right now. I'm sure he would like to change the, uh, um, uh, uh, change the topic of conversation um, as much as possible for the next few weeks, um, because this is it, having people um, think about the virus and his response um, is not winning him votes. So I'm going to put uh, uh, Professor Krupnikov and Feldman on the spot. Uh, we have a question, and you can answer as you wish, from Sarah Battaglia, who asks, do you have any prediction about who's going to win the presidential election? So you both ha happily avoided that. Um, who wants to start, or who wants to avoid it first? <laughs> <laughs> Professor K Krupnikov, do you want to start? Yeah. <laughs> You can avoid it. You can also explain why you're not coming up with the prediction. Um, you know, so I, I sort of, uh, I, my, my easy answer to that is that um, I, I don't make predictions. I, I study the psychology of how voters came up with their votes, um, uh, which, which is uh, where, where I would say. Um, I, I, I also sort of think if we think about uh, various models um, that are specifically rolling public opinion models, like Nate Silver models, um, 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 I think Elliot Mo um, Morris has a model. Um, I look at those as basically just probabilistic models. So if we look at the probabilities there, um, 
the, the argument would be that if we ran this election a hundred times, right, Biden would be more likely to win. But there's certainly uh, certain cases where Trump would win. And so I think that's where I fall, which is um, you never know which of those hundred times uh, we're going to end up with in November. So the prob um, even a small probability of someone else will winning is not nothing. How evasive was that? I was, I was pretty <laughs> you know, evasive. Are you satisfied with that answer? <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, I was going to say pretty much the same thing. Um, and again, you know, I think I just want to emphasize to people, part of the reason for uncertainty is just the difficulty of, of predicting how close states will come out in the electoral college. And again, you know, I think it, it, the popular vote doesn't decide the presidency, the electoral college does. And that first slide that I put up was, was an, you know, an effort to try to, to get home the view that, that the extent to which the election is even remotely close, small numbers of votes shifting um, in some key states can make an enormous difference in, in who wins. Now, having said that, um, I've seen a couple, again, simulations. And um, we know that Donald Trump won the Electoral College while losing the popular vote to Hillary Clinton by about 2%. Um, while the national, the national vote um, um, is not necessarily, a, isn't a perfect indication of how all individual states will vote, as that margin increases, right, as the percentage difference increases, the chances of a Biden victory in the Electoral College get more, get higher and higher. Um, they just have to. Um, um, and so I would be, I, I, the only prediction I'll make is I'll be really shocked if Donald Trump wins a majority of the popular vote, right? It's just looking at everything right now and seeing what happened four years ago. Um, it's just, it's not impossible, but it's really hard to, to, to see that happening. Um, I think, you know, the, the question, the question will be, um, uh, you know, can he come close enough to Joe Biden as he did to Hillary Clinton to throw the result into the, you know, t into a handful of close states um, and, and, um, and win the Electoral College? Um, that's not impossible, right? And I don't think anybody is going to, um, uh, anybody in their right mind would get up um, before election day and say that there's a hundred percent chance that either one of these candidates will win. Um, you know, we 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 just can't know that. Um, um, and you know, we'll have to wait for the outcome. The other, I guess, the other point I'll just make is that, you know, that that personally, I mean, I hope that whoever wins, it's not tight in key states because with problems of voting and mail-in voting and the like, I think it would not be a very good outcome if we all go to sleep on that Tuesday night, not having any idea who's got a majority in the Electoral College and maybe even wake up Wednesday morning and still not know who's got the majority in the Electoral College. So um, that's also something that I think we need to be um, concerned about. So I'm going to redirect this to, to Professor Norpard. Someone asked, uh, Chris Wellwood asked, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. How conf, oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry. I was going to ask another one. Uh, Jeff Krizina, sorry. He's asking you, can you explain how you came up with the electoral vote count breakdown this year? Well, <laughs> as, you, as, you, as, you, as you see from my, uh, from my presentation, I, I look at each presidential election since 1912, and for each of these elections, I have an electoral college number, uh, the Democratic electoral vote, actually. And uh, I do an analysis that, that uh, sort of predicts that number for every election since 1912. And 
So given what I have as predictors, which is the primary performance and uh, essentially uh, a measure of the sort of swinging back and forth, I get a particular prediction for 2020. And that prediction turns out to be like 362 for, uh, for, for Donald Trump. And, and given how far away that is from, let's say, 270, I mean, you imagine, I mean, 362 and 270, that's a pretty, uh, pretty big uh, gap. Uh, the, the, the chance of that, this happening, all right, uh, that uh, he will win if my prediction is, is, is 362 is something like, like 91%. I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, I don't run 100,000 simulations, but that's essentially what, what it is. I mean, statistically speaking, when you do this test, you essentially imagine that you're doing an infinite, infinite number of tests given, given your numbers, and then you can have, you can look at the distribution that you get there, like the normal curve or some curve like that. And you see, here I am, okay, and I cover 91 percent uh, that are above uh, 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 270, and, and that's essentially it. So the other way that, that I could might, might as well throw in right now, which, which is uh, also true, is that when I try to predict sort of, of course, post some of these elections, I get 25 of 27 correct. Like 20, 25 or 7, I predict the right winner. 25 out of 27, I mean, it's more than 90 percent. So, so that's another 90 percent uh, record that, 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 that I have, but it is a, a little complicated. I mean, it is something that we, we do as, as statistically trained people that uh, uh, we don't, I mean, can't go into all the details, but uh, that's how it works. And that's, I mean, I'm sure how May Silver and people like that do it too uh, when they come up with saying Trump has a, I don't know, 70% chance of winning, meaning getting above to, to, to 70. So that's and it's, it's a little bit uh, hairy uh, statistics that, uh, <laughs> that for which we spend a long time in this business to, to learn and, and, uh, and, and then apply. But uh, that's, that's it. If, okay. We're taking applicants for our PhD program if anyone yes. wants to learn with helmets and, uh, and learn how to do this. So I have a question for Professor Kripikov from Herman Reinhold. And he asks, do you have any data that shows an increased rate of voting could affect the outcome of a presidential election? It seems there'd be no impact if the candidate preferences of non-voters mirror that of voters. Um, so that was actually one of the really interesting things to come out of, uh, of the big uh, survey with Knight Foundation of the non-voters. Um, there had been these beliefs about kind of which way the non-voters would break if they were actually uh, going to turn out. Um, but of the non-voters who were certain uh, which candidate they would support, it was kind of uh, remarkably similar as the preferences of voters. Um, so, in theory, and this was kind of an impossible situation, if all of these chronic non-voters um, would somehow vote, it is not clear that they would, that it would be in favor of one candidate versus the other, um, which is why when uh, uh, candidates try to basically run their own get out the vote campaigns, they're not really targeting all non-voters or all occasional non-voters. They're targeting very specific groups of, of voters and non-voters, such as you did convince somebody it would have an outcome um, that is a beneficial to a specific candidate. But yes, one of the kind of surprising outcomes of this large oversample of, of non-voters is that uh, there isn't really an advantage for one party versus the other. Great. Um, and I think this is an important question that all of us might consider. Uh, it's from Chris Wellwood, who thanked us for the presentation, but asks, how confident are you with the state of polling in 2016 versus 2020? And I know personally, I feel this question so many times between 2016 and now. So uh, I don't know who wants to, does someone want to pick that up? Um, so uh, let me just say, I think you first need to distinguish between the national surveys and the state polls. That's where you have to start. Um, the national surveys in 2016 were not too bad, right? Um, the, I, I, I checked back and the, the, the average of the um, horse race polls just before the 2016 election 
had Hillary Clinton up by 3.9 percent, and she uh, or the popular vote, and she won, um, um, and she won by 2.1 percent of the popular vote. So they were a little less than two percent off. Um, and given sampling error and lots of other things, it's not bad. The problem in 2016 was the state the number of the state polls um, were misleading or or just simply not available um, um, toward the end of the campaign um, in order to be able to to get a good reading on on uh, on those states. So um, let's hope that um, the diagnoses of the problems with the state polls that came out after 2016 led to suitable changes in the way that the those state polls are are being run um, and um, if so um, uh, then um, you know we'll we, we, we won't know until unfortunately the day the day after the election um, if that's true so you know, I think um, the reason based upon recent history to be a little wary of the state polls. Um, on the other hand, we've got a lot of high quality survey organizations doing national polling. Um, and I feel somewhat more confident that, um, that they'll be reasonably close um, to the to get the uh, popular vote outcome correct. Yeah, Professor Mopa, yeah. You know what I find very intriguing about uh, polling uh, this year, I don't know whether that was the fact in 2016 that uh, polling that shows that uh, Biden is leading Trump by a substantial margin, which I know all these all these polls are showing, including Fox News and, and, and so on. But when they ask the question, who do you think is going to win the election? invariably people are saying Trump. That is, I think, a discrepancy that I don't think ever happened before. Normally we think people sort of follow the polls. They hear someone sort of leading in the polls and then they say, okay, that person's winning. There's something else going on. I don't know whether uh, we have enough research on that to figure out why that is happening. What are people basing that on? And it's, it's pretty substantial. I mean, and it, every time I've seen that question, I mean, I don't, I don't even know why, why they sort of asked that, but because it really casts some doubt about whether you can trust the, the breakdown that they find for the election. But I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, and then people have speculated that, and I know the APOR report on, on the polls of 2016 uh, took it up, et cetera, whether there was the shy, the secret Trump voter. And I don't think they really came to grips with that. And uh, I mean, that is anecdotal if we don't know it. But uh, uh, if it happens again, I mean, and Trump wins and then wins and I mean, she, I mean, I, I would agree with the stand that the, the, the popular vote is, is, is not very likely to go his way. If, if it does, it goes again, I mean, with some of the states that are, that are very competitive and, 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 and very close. But, but if it happens again, I think the polling industry has to really do some more uh, self-examination and figure out what, what is it, what are we... What are, what are we missing? And uh, I know a lot of them are nowadays, I mean, uh, internet polling, I mean, a lot of the companies are doing it and, and then waiting, waiting it after the fact that YouGov, I mean, I actually was joined up on, on, on YouGov, but I was so disappointed anytime they asked me to take a poll, it's about something I don't care about. I mean, like foods I like, uh, music I like, et cetera. They never asked me about anything any, anyway. So I, I don't know about this, some of these outfits. But I think the old-fashioned telephone polling, I think, is uh, is a dinosaur. I don't think with response rates of five percent or something in single digits that you can make any claim that you are getting getting to the bottom of public opinion. So I mean, I when I hear that telephone poll, I feel I'm not going to be too uh, too convinced. I mean, I'll just add my two cents in this since I have such a history with polling and surveys. Um, just. It is, I feel like it's very important to educate the public because we look at these polls. I think one thing that may have happened since 2016 is a lot of people have lost confidence in the polls. So even though Democrats are seeing 
that uh, Biden could win, according to these polls, they're highly skeptical. I think every time I mention polls, people roll their eyes and say, oh, polls, they're so incorrect. We don't have that information. I think on the contrary, we do have a lot of information that polls are diagnostic. So there are some problems that existed in 2016, just to try, this is a little arcane, but just, I think it's so important for people to understand this because you're looking at these things and trying to think, should I believe them? Should I not believe them? Um, one of the things that happened in the state polls in 2016 is that people failed to wait on education. That's one of the factors that's been pointed to that typically we're not quite sure who's going to, uh, for example, let me backtrack, a lot of people are missing from our polls. And typically it's very hard, I know because you do run a survey research center, very hard to get less well-educated men, for example, to participate in public opinion polls. They're busy, they're doing something else, they're not interested. And they were typically Trump supporters in 2016. So if we didn't, we might have readjusted, weighted up those people who did show up in the poll. But if you didn't do that on the basis of education, you were missing a distinctive voice. Um, and that voice was systematically missing. I disagree a little bit with Helmut. I feel like a lot of people have looked at the shy Trump voter question and um, there, there has been some studies and it, it's not clear that they exist. Um, I think after that's looked at, people, for example, if you live in Suffolk County, you'll notice that the Trump supporters are not all that shy. Um, if you've seen any of the, the local protests and, um, and rallies and so on. So I think that that's um, very debatable. So anyway, I, I urge you not to just throw out the polls. Uh, I urge you to participate in polls if someone asks you to. Um, and it turns out it's a big industry and a lot of money and a lot of outcomes depend on these polls. We will find out, but, um, but please don't write them off because as uh, Professor Felber was saying, they were reasonably accurate at the national level in 2016. And uh, we use them to interpret a great deal of what's going on. So that's my little, that's my religious push for polls. <laughs> um, so, uh, so sorry, no, I lost track of the questions. That's my passionate response to that. Um, this may be a little arcane, but uh, perhaps Professor Norpoth wants to answer about, uh, Frank Ross asked, any comments on Alan Lichtman's method of predicting? So these are competitive models. I know, I, I know. Well, Alan Lichtman has been, Alan and I have been together in many events, uh, even though I'm not face to face, but uh, they interview him, they interview me, they present it. My general attitude is that uh, during an election, I do not comment on fellow forecasters. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, a question for Professor Kripnikov from Shannon McGar. Does providing potential voters with information about the candidates, policies, and stances encourage them to vote, or would it overwhelm them? Um, that's a great question. So the information that's overwhelming is about the process of voting. Um, it, it, it turns out there's this really strange effect that um, if you break things up into small steps, um, even if each step is really easy, just because it looks like a lot of steps, it seems really, really difficult. And so it seems like it's something overwhelming to them. But information about candidate positions um, is sort of a different kind of um, uh, structure. It's really information about, um, not really about what people have to do. It's more information about, um, as you say, the candidates. Now, the one thing that I would be curious about and maybe worry a bit about is this idea that people might feel like this is everything I have to know in order to cast a vote, which might then make it seem a bit more difficult. But if it's sort of easily digestible information, if it's really easily comparable, um, then I think it could, in some sense, actually make the process easier for people, especially people who feel like they need to be um, more educated before casting a vote. Okay, so um, uh, let's see what else we have here. Um, so we have a question. Um, this is really, again, going back to the different approaches that we've been pursuing about the past versus the present. So Moss Warren asks, past performance is no guarantee of future performance, in quotes. Um, using models presupposes that the underlying statistical population doesn't change significantly so that models can work. So if the recent protests signify a transformative moment, 
then the underlying population changes. So I, I guess that's the idea that different people may be showing up to vote in this election re related to the racial justice protests because they have had um, a lot of people saying at these protests, like, please go vote. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Do we expect, to, and maybe this is a question for Professor Krupnikov about whether we expect, you've mentioned you don't, that there is that in-between group of the occasional voter. What do you think about the racial justice protests? Will that have any influence, do you think, um, on the voting electorate? So in recent surveys of younger people, so I'm specifically talking about younger people, there is kind of a tremendous, um, um, as, as I think the question says, a, a kind of a, a, a concern about racial justice. And there seems to be a lot of younger people who are really motivated by issues of, special, of, of racial justice. Um, and those same people report that they're going to turn out and vote. Um, a, a, a lot of these people have not been in the voting pool before because they were simply too young. So we don't know about kind of their past history. So we don't know where they fall yet. But there se does seem to be that connection, especially in terms of turning out uh, to vote. So I think um, if this is, uh, as it seems in surveys, to be a profoundly important issue, um, that is exactly the kind of motivation that I was talking about for somebody to overcome barriers. Now, of course, uh, the problem becomes, um, are the barriers that are placed, the logistical barriers that are placed in front of people when it comes to vote, um, are they actually going to be um, too much to overcome, even for somebody who very much wants to vote, um, even for somebody who is very much trying to vote. Uh, but in surveys, there's certainly that connection of new people who are kind of invigorated, who are really deeply concerned, who are specifically focusing on that issue uh, in terms of voter turnout. But again, this is surveys of specifically young people that are uh, focusing on here. Maybe I'll follow up with my own question again. I saw recently that there was a poll um, done of younger voters who said that they wanted, uh, some number of them wanted to vote by mail, but about half of them had no idea how to do that. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Does that tell us that the younger voter, even though they're just lacking the information required and that they're not going to show up? What are your thoughts? Um, so in the same surveys, this was again a, a survey conducted by the Knight Foundation of Younger People quite recently, um, there was that same concern that they weren't sure how to vote and how to do it. On the other hand, uh, the, the great thing about these younger voters is that they seem to be in social networks. Uh, more likely to be in tighter knit social networks. So the hope is that there is, if they're in these politically active social networks, that if they're in these groups that have now been to protest, they're very politically active, there is gonna be somebody within that network who uh, can direct them uh, uh, in the right direction, who could point them and basically educate uh, them in terms of voting. You know, there's this research, right, that if you have somebody in your social network who cares about voting, you're now so much more likely to vote. And the idea here might be that the same young people who made it to the protests um, are just much more likely to have somebody who is politically active in their network who will help them out. Uh, we have one complex question. I don't know if anyone wants to tackle this about ranked choice voting. Does anyone, Helmut, would you like to address ranked choice voting? It comes from Timothy Matthews. And he asks, what are your thoughts on ranked choice voting, uh, which is being used for the first time uh, by Maine this year? Um, will Maine's use of RCV get any attention on election night or will it just be buried as an issue by everything else that is going on? Um, and he comments that he's an economics PhD from 2002. Well, I think that's, that's what they do in Australia, right? You do yep. rank voting? Yeah. Uh, and just a, and a disclosure, everyone, I, I come from Australia, that's why. That's yeah, why. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think it's common in this country. I don't, I don't know. I mean, whether certain areas do it, I, I, would, I, would, th I would say that, uh, that, that all the people who are, who, are, who, are, who are clamoring to abolish the Electoral College. Of course, it's a very quiet clamor. I mean, this is an amazing phenomenon by itself that there isn't much more of a, of a movement going on to just get rid of the Electoral College. Well, if you had that, if you had a one vote in the national popular vote would decide that, and you didn't want to live with a candidate who gets less than 50% of majority, you would either have to think about plan B, like a runoff, or you'd have to have a ranked voting. You'd have to say, okay, 
in case, okay, one of these candidates doesn't get a majority, what's your second, what's your second choice? It would almost be uh, unavoidable to have something like, like, like that if you don't want to have another round of a national election going on. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that, that might be interesting on paper, but there just isn't any, uh, any energy behind it. I mean, there's nothing, nothing going to, to, uh, to implement it. So, and I'll, uh, I'll say also to Timothy that uh, in Australia, what happens, which seems crazy, but the parties issue your ranked preferences. And so you end up just doing, you get the party ranking and sometimes in the Senate, for example, they're, they're ranking 100, over 100 candidates, which is exceedingly difficult. Mm. And so people just take their party's suggestion. And even in the Senate now, you just check a box saying, I'm voting the party. Mm. Um, so it, in the end, uh, I'm not sure how terribly different that will be. It sounds good, I think, on paper. So I think it, I'm, Jan, I'm looking at it, just, just one. Oh, yeah. Just, just, just one comment, a very brief comment on that, because it got, really didn't get very much attention, and it obviously it's not the first time this happened, but um, you know, there were a, a number of states, I, I can't recall off the top of my head, where the sum of the third part votes for third party candidates, libertarian, green, et cetera, were well higher than the margin between Clinton and Trump um, in 2016. And so, you know that's sort of that's interesting in and of itself that um, that a number of people large large much larger number of people cast cast votes for one of the third parties than by far than the difference was in the votes between um, Clinton and Trump and um, I'm actually surprised that that hasn't gotten more attention. Um, since you know, since 2016, because of the impact it had on the outcome, um, we're out of time. I wanted to really thank. We have we hang uh, hung on to like almost 100 people. Judd, how's that? So thank you all for sticking with us, asking great questions. Um, go vote. Find out how to vote. Find a friend who knows how to vote, <laughs> um, and make your voices heard on election day. It's coming up. Thank you all so very much for being here and for, for spending this time with us. How special. And yes, thank you for our alumni and friend com community that joined us today. I agree, great questions, great discussion. Um, thanks to the Department of Political Science and the College of Arts and Sciences for your support and for staying with us virtually. This has been great, but hey, in four years, let's do this in person again, please. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Janet, for setting this up and Leone for moderating it. <laughs> thanks to everyone, it was great. And uh, keep it up, keep talking, keep discussing. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you.